Great. So, uh, lucky to be here. I'll start by asking a question. How many of you are familiar with the Innovation Center in this area? Okay, I'll make a few comments then, just uh, for the benefit of everybody else. Uh, the Innovation Center in this area is one of the family of companies that's associated with, uh, with the very Chekhov program. As such, um, our goal is similar to the Chekhov in the sense that our um, responsibility is on demand, on creating demand for dairy products in the United States. So our, our mission is to build trust and sales of dairy. In the particular case of the Innovation Center, the U.S. Dairy, what we do is we um, are the way by which the dairy farmers in the United States can actually work with dairy processors and manufacturers uh, on topics that are of interest to both uh, pieces of the, of, the, of the dairy industry um, in a pre-competitive manner to address barriers to innovation, technology, etc. And so, as such, the, the center actually works on a very large variety of topics. And today, I am here to really only talk about one project that's called Cow the Future that falls within one topic that's dealt by within uh, that's dealt by the Innovation Center to use dairy, which is the topic of sustainability. So I will start my presentation by uh, sharing with you the way in which we talk about sustainability and the way in which we um, conceptualize sustainability. And that is that, in fact, it is a legacy of a stewardship that ha was based on or, or has been based on good business decisions. So, in fact, I will share two slides right after this one, that try to make the point of what I'm, what I'm describing over here. And that is that dairy farmers as individual operators throughout the history of the dairy industry in the United States have been making good business decisions that have led to beneficial uh, results in terms of sustainability. And in order to do that, I will show you some information that in fact has been, in a certain sense, shared with you already in the general session, but I'm gonna share it with you in a little bit of a different way. And I've got two graphs, and both graphs are, are similar. Um, this particular graph shows emissions of enteric methane on uh, the y-axis. I know that you guys cannot read the, the numbers from back there, but uh, the scale goes anywhere from zero all the way to um, 60 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalents. And then on the x-axis, we have yield expressed in pounds per cow. And finally, we have a third dimension on this graph, which is the size of the bubble. And that size of the bubble um, represents the total production for that particular country. As you probably noticed by the, by the tax over here, this particular graph shows a number of selected countries. This happened to be, um, I think, the... 10 or 15 countries that, that, that produce most milk plus some additional country of interest. And right now what we're looking at is the year 1961. So in fact, what I am going to do is I am going to play this graph and we are going to see how uh, these different emissions and yield per cow and productivity have changed over time between the year 1961 and the year 2012. And it's not gonna work. <laughs> Oops. Okay, let's go again. Sometimes it does this because I press on the wrong spot. Okay, here we go. And so you can see that clearly the United States of America, which started at the very top in this graph, has been moving downwards in, the, in terms of emissions and has been moving towards a higher yield. You can see that that is also the case for other countries such as France and Germany. And yet you also see that certain countries in the world have moved in the complete opposite direction, starting from a low yield and low emissions, increasing emissions, but really not increasing yield, and at the same time, increasing the size of the bubble quite rapidly. Why am I showing you this? Because in essence, uh, in the world, People are trying to meet the demand for dairy products. But different countries and different industries from different countries have been trying to do this 
using two basic different strategies. One strategy is the one that you've seen here for the United States and some of the other countries uh, like France and Germany that have focused on individual cow productivity and in that way have been able to increase their total amount of milk produced to meet the demand for their customers and at the same time have reduced the total emissions they produce. Other countries on the other side, I'm sorry, and reduce their herd sizes. On the other side, other countries, such as India, Brazil, or China, which I have measured or which I put up here and then marked over on the left-hand side of the graph, you've seen that the primarily, uh, primary strategy has been to increase the herd size. So definitely, there's a, a difference here, but, at this, but what I do want to emphasize is that no matter where you are, in the world because there is an increased demand for milk, those industries are pressed to meet that demand and there are different ways in which uh, that, that demand has been met in the past. In the United States, we have focused on more yield per cow, which reduced the number of cows and because of that productivity, we've been able to reduce the emissions. That is an example of good business decisions uh, leading to also beneficial environmental outcomes. Of course, telling the story from the year 1961 all the, all the way to the year 2012 is simply not enough. Because our customers, and here when we, when we use the word customer, I'm actually referring to organizations that purchase milk from a dairy farmer. I'm not actually talking to the consumers. Although these customers do uh, uh, behave according to what they hear from the consumer. They respond to the consumer demand. But the, the thing that I'm trying to point out here is that customers demand continuous proof of responsibility. So it's not only good enough to show the type of change that the dairy industry in the United States has undergone throughout the last 50 or 60 years. Customers want to see what change is taking place now and what change is going to take place into the future. So this is one of the, one of the main factors that drives many of the efforts by the sustainability group within the Innovation Center to continue uh, putting, empowering the farmers to make changes that uh, are beneficial. Now, of course, the philosophy is a little bit different than uh, maybe what uh, some folks have, uh, have said or what some folks think uh, we should be doing, which is telling farmers how to farm. And I, I tell you that in my experience, and I'm pretty sure most of you have had a similar type of experience, uh, farmers are very independent people that have very good ideas and like to try out things. And so the real, the real best way to address this uh, that is most respectful and is also usually leading to better uh, results because we have seen what farmers have been that have done in the past without even thinking about the environment is to actually give them opportunities and let them choose what is best for their own operation. Now having said that, methane mitigation is one of the big uh, pushes or big focus um, that have been put in place by the Innovation Center. And so um, in the year 2013 we put together a review that is uh, published in the journal Dairy Science that looks at enteric methane mitigation opportunities uh, that are available right now. And so you can see here that we're talking about feed and animal management practices that improve livestock productivity are probably the ones that provide the most cost-effective means to reduce methane emissions per unit of milk produce. And remember, we talk about methane emissions per unit of milk produced because our goal is to meet the demand of our, of our consumers. And they, you know, so therefore, we need to understand what is our footprint per the unit of product that we put on the shelf for them to buy. There's aspects of animal management, there's aspects of genetic improvement, and there's also aspects of nutrition and feeding that uh, are discussed in this particular uh, report. But, uh, but today I'm actually going to focus on another report that uh, I brought a little, a little thing for all of you, this uh, business card. And what I would like you to do is to take one business card and pass it over to the next, to the person next to you. I'm going to give you this, and then I'm going to give you the most for free. 
you know, don't say that. <laughs> so take one and, and pass the next uh, uh, the, the, the file over. And basically what I'm, what I'm talking about here is a report that we put together that's called Considerations and Resources on Feed and Animal Management. Because again, uh, a lot of these goals can be achieved if we focus on animal and feed management, managing the animals and the feed in the farms, and giving the farmers different opportunities for them to choose what's best for each operation. So here I'm just going to use this uh, infographic uh, to kind of walk you through what the, what the report looks like, and then I'll show you some specific examples. So we're talking about a particular report that looks at improving productivity and profitability while at the same time reducing enteric emissions. The idea is that we have a comprehensive and easy to use reference that allows farmers to choose for themselves. And therefore, we took the topic of feed management and broke it down into three different uh, chapters, and the topic of animal management and broke it down into three different chapters for a total of six chapters. And within those six, six chapters, we address 34 different topics. And each one of these 34 different topics are actually addressed in the same way. There's three elements that, that uh, I discuss for each topic. First of all, we have a short narrative that summarizes the topic and explains why it is uh, beneficial for both productivity, profitability, and enteric methane reduction. Then we provide a table with considerations on that particular topic that, again, provides guidance, but it is not prescriptive because it allows, in this way, the farmer to choose what suits best for their operation. And next to those considerations is a list of resource resources also in tabular form that are hyperlinkable, so or hyperlinkable, I should say. So the farmer can actually click on the button and then open up, let's say, a Cornell Nutrition Conference proceeding, or you know, uh, uh, an extension publication, or actually a maybe even a journal or dairy science paper when applicable. And in that way, they can go in depth as much as they need to to understand the particular basis for that for that for that uh, recommendation or you know, different alternatives. Again, this is something that we didn't do alone. The, all of this work was put together and developed by more than 40 dairy professionals uh, that collaborated with us throughout the, about a two-year period. So I am going to go through the chapters now fairly quickly, and I am going to uh, put most of the responsibility for the presentation here on you, because I am 100% sure that you can read quicker than and I can talk, you know? So <laughs> I, I'm sure you're gonna read all of these before I even say anything, right? So the first topic is about Russian formulation and feeding. And in this particular topic, we have a number of um, recommendations. As I said, the report itself contains something in the, in the neighborhood of 200 recommendations. So what I am showing with you, what I'm sharing with you today, are just uh, a very high level synthesis of what those recommendations would look like. But I do want to show them to you because, I, as I said again, you're going to be able to read them, to read through these fairly quickly, and in that way you're going to get a feel for how we treat each one of these topics. So there's focus on things such as human function, there's focus on things such as you know requirements for energy and amino acids while you're formulating. There's also focus on some other practical aspects such as how you analyze your ingredients uh, you know, in order to formulate your rations. Or how, for example, you actually feed the ration once it's formulated. So again, a number of different considerations that makes these uh, farmers, but also it can be used by nutritionists, by veterinarians, by crop specialists to think about the topics that they need to think about or consider when they're trying to make a decision on farm. The second topic on feed, on feed uh, management has to do with forage management. Obviously, forage being such a large portion of the diet, it's very important. Once again, a variety of topics here. Uh, we've included a, a piece just to talk about what, what is the importance of forage and what are the contributions to the diet. And then from there, how to not only establish and grow forage, but also how to harvest, process it, 
and how to, how to store it and feed it out. So again, a number of different recommendations. Remember, each one of these will be followed by a list of resources that are hyperlink accessible. In the case of concentrate management, the idea here is that farmers are able to think about the strategic use of concentrates. So we provide uh, a breakdown by carbohydrates and then by proteins and amino acids, also lipids. And of course, as you can imagine, uh, the aspect of lipids and fat is important in terms of enteric methane reduction because it is one of the met methane mitigation practices that has been studied the most and where most data is available. So um, there are some specific recommendations here, for example, to try to get uh, your diet at a fairly high lipid concentration if you can do it. Obviously, that depends on the total composition of the diet in the particular conditions. But also the use of, for example, byproduct feeds, some of which can be used as vehicles to bring in lipid into the diet, uh, and also how to uh, maybe evaluate feed additives to see if they are appropriate for their particular situation. In the case of, of uh, animal management, the situation is a little bit different because many of the effects are actually, in fact, going to be indirect effects. And so you're going to see here that, for example, we've got simple things in cattle and heifer management, such as an emphasis on record keeping to make sure that, in fact, their animals are growing as you know they are supposed to be growing. And so a number of, uh, of uh, recommendations, we have quite a few here for cattle and heifer management, that deal, for example, with uh, just making sure that we have healthy animals. Because at the end of the day, uh, if an animal grows and remains healthy, it will eventually become uh, a mature, healthy, productive cow. And so all of the enteric methane that this animal produced during its rearing phase will actually be diluted out by the milk that they produce during their lactation. And so in that way, what we're doing is we're indirectly mitigating uh, methane emissions by making sure that most of the animals we grow out they actually end up contributing soluble products like milk. And so, again, you can see some of these, some of these are very basic, like, you know, vaccinations, developing a program for vaccination that's appropriate for your farm in accordance with, uh, you know, the relationship that you have with your veterinarian. And also some aspects of, of reproduction uh, as well, because once again, uh, as for most of you that were here in the first uh, talk, if you're, if you're losing, you know, in terms of your reproductive efficiency, once again, you're losing animals, you're losing productivity that contribute to enteric methane, but don't necessarily contribute to productivity of your farm, and therefore your uh, footprint per unit of milk produced is reduced. Transition cow management is obviously very important because a large number of the issues that we face in dairy farms actually initiate during this period in the cow's uh, lifetime, there's there's a lot of changes going on, and therefore uh, it is important to even if you don't even if you don't if you can see results right away, uh, it actually pays back later on in the subsequent lactation. Interestingly, one of the topics that we ended up including here and which uh, gets me really excited is this use of technology for cow management. It's in fact a topic I like to point out because. Uh, we include it here under transition cow management, but it's also applicable to lactating cow management. And for you guys that were here for the first talk, you saw some very uh, clear, concrete uh, examples of how those technologies can actually help dairy farmers um, manage cattle better. And as you think about it, in the, in the past, when the dairy industry was really composed of a very, very large uh, amount of farms each of which contained very few cows, uh, the farmer was on top of each cow. And there was individual cow management taking place. However, as consolidation started occurring, and now you have larger number of, of cows in a farm, usually what's happening is that uh, dairy managers and farmers are actually managing populations of cows. These particular technologies, I believe, uh, are a way in which we can start bringing back that individualized management of cows, but at a different, in a different way. We're not replacing humans for technology. In fact, what we're doing is we're using humans together with technology 
to bring back this individualized care for our country where you know they are housed in these large uh, farms where you have you know, big populations of animals and you couldn't do it otherwise you know unless you had an army of people looking after all the animals which is is not going to work finally lactating cow management would be the last chapter um, obviously milk production efficiency is important uh, because it contributes to both aspects and therefore we have topics everywhere from milk quality through mastitis, cow comfort, and also, again, once again, reproduction, but also culling. And culling is one of those topics that is, that is fairly controversial because um, customers, and again, I'm going back to the people that end up purchasing milk products because they're going to sell it to a consumer, many times ask questions that are related to culling. I don't know why this thing is moving forward. Maybe my finger is a little bit uh, twitchy. Um, ha ask questions that are related to culling without necessarily understanding all of the factors that go into a culling decision. And so I will give you, I will share with you an anecdote that's a very uh, clear, concrete example of, of this topic. Um, the Sustainability Consortium, which is uh, a group that puts together, um, what they, they, they basically put together questionnaires to go ask uh, their suppliers and try to measure how sustainable they are. And they do it for uh, products across the board. So you've got guys, you know, they're working, or teams of people working to put together a questionnaire for, to, to assess the sustainability of a shoe manufacturer. And those same folks may be, you know, work for dairy cows, which milk, which is uh, quite a different situation. But one question that came from, uh, from those folks was related to lifetime, to how lifetime. And there was a, a direct assumption that greater lifetimes meant, uh, you know, greater sustainability, and that it was necessary to have, you know, old cows. That a, a farm that had a bunch of old cows was going to be better in terms of sustainability from a farm that had, you know, younger animals. And so we had to engage with them and, and, and explain to them, and, and you know, get them into a conversation to explain to them that in fact these, these decisions of cloning. Uh, you know, depend on such a variety of factors that you cannot take lifetime of an animal as an indicator of sustainability. It's in, it's in fact not a good indicator of sustainability. And eventually they, they drop that particular question from the questionnaire, which we believe is, is a right thing to do because the last thing that you want is our customers trying to respond to a consumer demand or a consumer perception engaging our industry producers and asking them questions that really make no, make no sense because they don't address the final consumer perception. So I gave you a copy of the card and in the back side of that card there is a website and I encourage you to go into that website and download the PDF of this book and read it and you know give it to all other folks as, as you wish you know uh, because we have found out a few other things that are interesting about this particular report that I will have to be completely honest and confess uh, were not necessarily uh, objectives that we had when we put this book in place. And some of that comes across from this particular quote from the editor of Dairy Today magazine when we showed, we did an a, a, a initial show to the media of this, of this report and Again, you probably already read it, but Jim Dickel said that, um, again, it's user-friendly and offers basic information, but here's the point. It could easily be used as a foundational text for beginning dairy science class. And so, you know, this happened back in the, this, this quote, he said this at World Dairy Expo last year, and I wrote it down verbatim because I wanted to use him, and I asked him, can I use this? And he said, absolutely, you can use it, you know? And then, in fact, he went ahead and, and put it in, you know, the, in, in what he wrote on, on, on Dairy Today. But after that, once, you know, we started uh, distributing this book, lots of folks came to me and said, yes, this is absolutely something that I'm planning to do. Uh, uh, professors at university that are using it as, as a tool for, for basic, you know, teaching some of the basic uh, dairy science classes. Uh, even uh, the eastern portion of the United States, the DFA, a large, you know, large, very large call 
is using this to train their fields. So in fact, something like this is something that we, we didn't really have as an objective, but shows the power of simplifying some of these topics, synthesizing and putting into people's hands just hyperlinks to valuable information that they can use to make decisions. Finally, another, another point I want to make is that not only do we empower dairy farmers with science to improve, uh, to explore, sorry, these improvement opportunities. I really hammered on this topic quite a lot throughout the presentation. But also, we also try to empower communicators with science to inform the consumers. So at the Innovation Center, we have an integrated communication department that works in trying to get these types of communications out through the industry, such as retailers, uh, you know, organizations such as Domino's Pizza, you know, that want to put something in the, in the pizza box about, you know, dairy farms. And I don't know how many of you have actually seen some of those uh, things on the pizza boxes, you know. Uh, you can raise your hand if you see, if you've seen them. Um, you know, we didn't uh, intend to make this report something like this, but eventually what's happened, to our surprise, is that we've been able to use this report and talk in lay terms to organizations, for example, such as McDonald's, when they have a question about why are dairy farmers doing uh, such a thing, you know, such a specific management practice this way, you know. And so we say it's not capricious, you know, because, you know, there are other people when, you know, they want to do it this way because that's the only way they can think about doing it. But in fact, it's because all of these considerations are in place before a decision is made at the dairy farm. And so it has actually served the purpose of communicating down our uh, downstream customers quite well as well. Okay, with that, I'd like to uh, finish my presentation. If you have any questions, uh, I'll address them now. But also, if anything else comes up later on, you know, because sometimes we do need to reflect upon these presentations, you do have my email address over here. Um, and you already have in that uh, little card the website. So you can, if you cannot remember this email address, you can always find it, find it by going to the website. So thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you.